the Hebrews created history as we know it. You don't get away with anything. And so you might think you can bend the fabric of reality and that you can treat people instrumentally and that you can bow to the tyrant and violate your conscience without cost. You will pay the piper. It's going to call you out of that slavery into freedom, even if that pulls you into the desert. And we're going to see that there's something else going on here that is far more cosmic and deeper than what you can imagine. The highest ethical spirit to which we're beholden is presented precisely as that spirit that allies itself with the cause of freedom against tyranny. And yes, there, there exactly. Is that hope. I want villains to get punished. But do you want I, the I, villains to learn before they have to pay the ultimate price? That's such a Christian question. <laughs> That has to do with attention, by the way. It has to do with, with sure. a subsidiary hierarchy, like a hierarchy of attention, which is set up in a, in, in a way in which all the levels can have room to exist, let's say. And so, you know, yeah. the, the, these new, the new systems, the new way, let's say the new urban, urbanist movement, similar to what you're talking about, yeah. that's what they've understood. It's like we need places of intimacy in terms of the house. We need places of communion in terms of, you know, uh, parks and alleyways and, and buildings where we meet and a church, all these places right. that kind of manifest our communion together. Yeah, so so those existed coherently for long periods of time. And then the abundance post-World War II and some ideas about like what, what life could be like caused this big change. And that change satisfied some needs, people got houses, but broke community needs and then new sets of ideas about what's the synthesis, what's the possibility of having your own home, but also having community, not having to drive 15 minutes for every single thing. And some people live in those worlds and some people don't. Do you think we'll be smart? So one of the problems well, that why, to emerge there why is were we these, smart enough to well, solve some of those problems? Because we had 20 years, but yeah. now, because one of the things that's happening yeah. now is, we're, as you pointed out earlier, is we're going to be producing equally revolutionary transformations, but at a much smaller scale of time. What's natural to our children is so different than was natural to us, but what was natural to us was very different from our parents. So some, some changes get accept, accepted generationally really fast. So what's made you so optimistic? <laughs> Hello, everyone watching on YouTube or listening on associated platforms. I'm very excited today to bring to be bringing you two of the people I admire most intellectually, I would say, and morally for that matter, Jonathan Pajot and uh, Jim Keller, very different thinkers. Jonathan Pajot is a French-Canadian liturgical artist and icon carver known for his work featured in museums across the world. He carves Eastern Orthodox, among other traditional images, and teaches an online carving class. He also runs a YouTube channel, This Symbolic World, dedicated to the exploration of symbolism across history and religion. Jonathan is one of the deepest religious thinkers I've ever met. Jim Keller is a microprocessor engineer known very well in the relevant communities and beyond them for his work at Apple and AMD, among other corporations. He served in the role of architect for numerous game-changing processors, has co-authored multiple instruction sets for highly complicated designs, and is credited for being the key player behind AMD's renewed ability to compete with Intel in the high-end CPU market. In 2016, Keller joined Tesla, becoming vice president of autopilot hardware engineering. In 2018, he became a senior vice president for Intel. In 2020, he resigned due to disagreements over outsourcing production, but quickly found a new position at Tens Torrent as chief technical officer. We're going to sit today and discuss the perils and promise of artificial intelligence. And uh, it's a conversation I'm very much looking forward to. So welcome to all of you watching and listening. I thought it would be interesting to have a three-way conversation. Um, 
Jonathan and I have been talking a lot lately, especially with John Verveke and some other people as well, about the fact that we seem, it seems necessary for us to view, for human beings to view the world through a story. In fact, that our, when we describe the structure that governs our action and our perception, that is a story. And so we've been trying to puzzle out, I would say to some degree on the religious front, what might be the deepest stories. And I'm very curious about the fact that we perceive the world through a story, human beings do, and that seems to be a fundamental part of our cognitive architecture and of cognitive architecture in general, according to some of the world's top neuroscientists. And I'm curious, and I know Jim is interested in cognitive processing and, and in building systems that in some sense seem to run in a manner analogous to the manner in which our brains run. And so I'm curious about the overlap between the notion that we have to view the world through a story and what's happening on the AI front. There's all sorts of other places that we can take the conversation. So maybe I'll start with you, Jim. Do you want to tell people what you've been working on and maybe give a bit of a background to everyone about how, to, how you conceptualize artificial intelligence? Yeah, sure. So first, I'll say technically I'm not an artificial intelligent researcher. I'm a computer architect. And I'd say my skill set goes from, you know, somewhere around the atom up to the program. So we, uh, we make transistors out of atoms. We make logical gates out of transistors. We make computers out of logical gates. We run programs on those. And recently, we've been able to run programs fast enough to do something called an a artificial intelligence model or a neural network, depending on how you say it. Um, and then we're building chips now that run artificial intelligence models fast. And we have a novel way to do it, the company I work at. Um, but lots of people are working on it. And I think we were sort of taken by surprise what's happened in the last five years, how quickly models started to do interesting and intelligent seeming things. Um, there's been an estimate that human brains do about 10 to the 18th operations a second, which sounds like a lot. It's a billion, billion operations a second. And a, a little computer, you know, the processor in your phone probably does 10 billion operations a second, you know, ish. And then if you use the GPU, maybe 100 billion, something like that. And big modern AI computers like OpenAI uses or Google or somebody, they're doing like 10 to the 16th, maybe, maybe slightly more operations a second. So they're within a factor of 100 of a, of a human brain's raw computational ability. And by the way, that could be completely wrong. Our understanding of how the human brain does com computation could be wrong, but lots of people have estimated based on number of neurons, number of connections, how fast neurons fire, how many operations a neuron firing seems to involve. I mean, the estimates range by a couple orders of magnitude, but when our computers got fast enough, we started to build things called language models and image models that do fairly remarkable things. So what have you seen in the last few years that's been indicative of this, of the change that you describe as revolutionary? What, what, are, the, what are computers doing now that you, that you found surprising because of this increase in speed. Yeah, you can have a language model read a 200,000 word book and summarize it fairly accurately. So it can extract out the gist. The gist of it. Mm -hmm. Can it do that with fiction? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm gonna introduce you to a friend who took a language model and changed it <clears throat> and fine tuned it with Shakespeare and used it to write screenplays that are pretty good. Hmm. Hmm. And, and these kinds of things are really interesting. And then uh, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. So when computers do computations, you know, a program will say add A equal B plus C. The computer does those operations on representations of information, ones and zeros. It doesn't understand them at all. The computer has no understanding of it. But what we call a language model translates information like words and images and ideas into a space where the program 
the ideas and the operation it does on them are all essentially the same thing. We'll be right back with Jonathan Pajot and Jim Keller. First, we wanted to give you a sneak peek at Jordan's new documentary, Logos and Literacy. I was very much struck by how the translation of the biblical writings jump-started the development of literacy across the entire world. Illiteracy was the norm. The pastor's home was the first school, yeah. and every morning it would begin with singing. The Christian faith is a singing religion. Probably 80% of scripture memorization today exists only because of what is sung. This is amazing. Here we have a Gutenberg Bible, Bible printed on the press of Johann Gutenberg. Science and religion are opposing forces in the world, but historically that has not been the case. Now the book is available to everyone. From Shakespeare to modern education and medicine and science to, to civilization itself. It is the most influential book in all of history, and hopefully people can walk away with at least a sense of that. Right, so a language model can produce words and then use those words as inputs. And it seems to have an understanding of what those words are. So I'm, which I'm, is very different from how a computer well, I'm curious operates about, on data. About the language models, I mean, my sense of, at least in part, how we understand a story is that maybe we're watching a movie, let's say, and we get some sense of the character's goals, and then we see the manner in which that character perceives the world, and we, in some sense, adopt his goals, which mm -hmm. is to identify with the character, mm -hmm. and then we play out a panoply of emotions and motivations on our body because we now inhabit that goal space and we understand the character as a consequence of mimicking the character with our own physiology. And you, you have computers you could, that can summarize the gist of a story, but they don't have that underlying physiology. Well, well so, first of all, that's, it's a theory that your physiology has anything to do with it. You could understand the character's goals, and then get involved in the details of the story. And then you're predicting the path of the story and also having expectations and hopes for the story. Yeah. And a good story kind of takes you on a ride because it teases you with doing some of the things you expect, but also doing things that are unexpected. And yeah. possibly that creates emotional... That could yeah, crazy. it does. It does. So in an AI model... So you can easily have a set of goals. So you have your personal goals. And then when you watch the story, you have those goals. Yeah. So you put those together. Like how many goals is that? Like the story's goals and your goals, hundreds, thousands? Those are small numbers, right? And then you have the story. The AI model can predict the story too, just as well as you can. How do you? And. That's the thing that I find and, mysterious is that it As can, the story progresses, it can look at the error between what it predicted and what actually happened, mm -hmm. and then iterate on that. Right. So you would call that emotional excitement, disappointment. Anxiety. Anxiety, Yeah, perhaps. definitely. Those, well, a big part of what anxiety right. and does those, seem those to be states, is discrepancy. Like some of those states are manifest in your body because you trigger hormone cascades yeah. and a bunch of stuff, but you also can just scan your brain and see that stuff move around. Right. Right. And... You know, the AI model can have an error function and look at the difference between what it expected and not, and you could call that the emotional state. Yeah, yeah, well, if I, you want I, I just like, talked with the... Director. And that's speculation, but... No, no, I think that's accurate. But, uh, you know, we can make an AI model that could predict the result of a story probably better than the average person. So one I mean, of the... Some thing... people are really good at, you know, they're really well-educated about stories or they know the genre or something, but... yeah. But, you know, these things, and what they see today is the capacity of the models is, if you say start describing a lot, it'll make sense for a while, but it'll slowly stop making sense. But that, that's possible, that's simply the capacity of the model right now. And the, the model is not well enough, grounded enough in a set of, let's say, goals and reality or something to make so, sense for So a what do you think would happen, Jonathan? This is, this is oh, I, think, a, I think, associated with the kind of things that we've talked through to some degree. So... One of my hypotheses, let's say, about deep stories is that they're, they're, they're 
metagists in some sense. So you could imagine a hundred people telling you a tragic story, and then you could reduce each of those tragic stories to the gist of the tragic story, and then you could aggregate the gists, and then you'd have something like a meta tragedy. And I would say the deeper the gist, the more religious like the story gets. And that's part of it's that idea is part of the reason that I wanted to bring you guys together. I mean, one of the things that what you just said makes me wonder is imagine that you took Shakespeare and you took Dante and you took like the, the canonical Western writers and you trained an AI system to, to mm -hmm. understand the structure of each of them. And then, and now you have, you could pull out the summaries of those structures, the gists, and then couldn't you pull out another gist out of that? So it would be like well, the essential element of well, Dante and Shakespeare and, I, I want to hear what Jonathan thinks so far. And then, <laughs> so, so, so there's here's here's one funny thing to think about. You use the word pull out. So, when you train a model to know something, you can't just look in it and say, "What does it know?" You have to query it. Right. You have right. to ask. Right. Right. What's the next sentence in this paragraph? What's the answer to this question? There's a thing on the internet now now called prompt engineering. And it's the same way. I I can't look in your brain to see what you think. Yeah. I have to ask you what you think because if I killed you and scanned your brain and got the got the current state of all the synapses and stuff, a you'd be dead, which would be sad, and b I wouldn't know anything about your thoughts. Your thoughts are embedded in this model that your brain carries around, and you can express it in a lot of ways. And so the so you could add. Yeah. How do you so, train? So, so I, this is my my big question. Is I mean, because the way that I've been seeing it until now is that that artificial intelligence is it it's based on us. It's not. It doesn't exist independently from humans, and it doesn't have care. The question would be, why does the computer care? Yeah, that's 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 not true. Well, why does the computer care to get the gist of the story? Well, yeah. So I think you're asking kind of the wrong question. So so you can train an AI model on like the physics and reality and images in the world just with images. And there are people who are figuring out how to train a model with just images, but the, the model itself still conceptualizes things like tree and dog and action and run because those all exist in the, in the world, right? So, and you can actually train, so, and when you train a, a model with all the language and words, so all information has structure. And I know you're a structure guy from your video. So if you look around you at any image, every single point you see makes sense. Yeah. Right? But it, it's, a tele, no, it's a teleological structure. It's like a, it's a purpose in, laid in structure. Right? So this is something yeah, we Yeah, so it turns out all the words that have ever been spoken by human beings also have structure. Right. Right. And... And so physics has structure, and then it turns out that some of the deep structure of images and actions and words and sentences are related. Mm -hmm. Like there's actually a common core of, like imagine there's like a knowledge space. And, and sure, there's details of humanity where, you know, they prefer this, this accent versus that. Those are kind of details, but they're coherent in the language model. But the language models themselves are coherent with our world ideas. Mm -hmm. And humans are trained in the world just the way the AI models are trained in the world. Like, like a little baby, as it's learning, looking around, it's training on everything it sees when it's very young. And then its training rate goes down, and it starts interacting what it's, with what it's learning, interacting with the people around it. But it's it. trying to survive. It's, it's trying to live. It has, like it has a, the, the infant well, or the child has the neurons a neurons aren't trying... The, the weights and the neurons aren't trying to live. What they're trying to do is reduce the error. So neural networks generally pr are predictive things, like what's coming next? What makes sense? You know, how does this work? And when you train, a, uh, when you train an AI model, you're training it to reduce the error in the model. And if your so, model's so big... Let me, okay, let, let me ask you about that. So, well, first of all, and, and so babies are doing the same thing. Like they're looking at stuff go around, and in the beginning, their neurons are just randomly firing. But as it starts to get object permanence and look at stuff, yeah. it starts predicting what will make sense for that thing to do. 
and when it doesn't make sense, it'll 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 update its model. So basically, it compares its prediction to the events, and then it will adjust yeah. its its prediction. So in a in a story prediction model, the AI would predict the story, then compare it to its prediction, and then fine tune itself yeah. slowly as it yeah. trains itself. Okay. Or, so, or so in now, reverse, you could ask it to say, given the set of things, tell the rest of the story, and it could do that. Mm-hmm. Right, and that's what, and the, and the state of it right now is there are people having conversations with us that are pretty good. Mm-hmm. So right. I, I talked to Carl Friston about yeah. this yeah. prediction idea in some detail, and so mm-hmm. Friston, for those of you who are watching and listening, is one of the world's top neuroscientists, and he's developed an entropy enclosure model of conceptualization, which is analogous to one that I was working on, uh, I suppose, approx- across approximately the same time frame. So the first issue, and this has been well established in the neuropsychological literature for quite a long time, is that anxiety is an indicator of discrepancy between prediction and actuality. And then positive emotion also looks like a discrepancy reduction indicator. So imagine that you're moving towards a goal, Mm -hmm. and then you, you evaluate what happens as you move towards the goal. And if you're moving in the right direction, what happens is what you might say what you expect to happen, and that produces positive emotion, and it's actually an indicator of reduction in entropy. That's that's one way of looking at, looking sure. at it. Then the the point is, so, is that so you, you, yeah, you have a, the, you have a bunch of words in there that are psychological definitions of states, but you could say there's a prediction and an error of prediction. Yes, and you're reducing error. Like yes, that's but, the, but but what's it, what you, but what I what I'm trying to make a case for is that your emotions directly map that both positive and negative emotion look like they're signifiers of discrepancy reduction, both on the positive and negative emotion side. But then there's a, a complexity that that I think is germane to part of Jonathan's query, which is that so the neuropsychologists and the cognitive scientists have talked a lot of long time about expectation prediction and discrepancy reduction. Mm -hmm. But one of the things they haven't talked about is it it isn't exactly that you expect things. It's that you desire them. You want them to happen. Like, because you could imagine that there's there's in some sense a literally infinite number of things you could expect. And we, we don't strive only to match prediction. We strive to bring about what it is that we want. And so we have these preset yeah. systems that are teleological, that are motivational systems. Well, you know, I mean, it depends. Like if you're sitting idly on the beach, like and a bird flies by, you expect it to fly along in a, a regular path. Right. But you, you don't also, really want that to happen. Yeah, but you don't but, want it to turn into something that could peck out your eyes either. Like sure. there's so a that's a want. There. Yeah. But but you're you're kind of following it with your expectation to look for a discrepancy. Right? Yes. Now you also have a, you know, depends on the person, somewhere between 10 and a million desires, right? And, and then you also have fears and avoidance. And those are context. So if you're sitting on the beach with some anxiety that the birds are going to swerve at you and yeah. pick your eyes out. Yeah. So then you might be watching it much more attentively than somebody who doesn't have that worry, for example. Right. Well, but both of you can predict where it's going to fly, and well, you will both notice a discrepancy. Right. The, the motivations. One way of conceptualizing fundamental motivation is they're like do, they're like a priori prediction domains, mm-hmm. right? And so, and it helps us narrow our attentional focus because I know I know mm-hmm. when you're when you're sitting and 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 you're not motivated in any sense, mm-hmm. you can be doing just in some sense trivial expectation computations. But mm-hmm. often we're in a highly motivated state, sure. and what we're expecting is bounded by what we desire and what we desire is oriented, as Jonathan pointed out, towards the fact that we want to exist. And one of the things I don't understand and wanted to talk about today is how the how the computer models, the AI models, can generate intelligible sense without this, without mimicking that sense of motivation. Well, like because you've said, for example, they can just derive the patterns from observations of the objective world, but there's a- So, so let's, so again, I don't want to do all the talking, but so so AI, generally speaking, like when I first learned about it, it had two two behaviors. They call it inference and training. So inference is you have a trained model. So you say you give it a picture and say, is there a cat in it? And it tells you where the cat is. That's inference. The model has been trained to know where a cat is. And training is the process of giving it an input and an expected output. 
And when you first start training the model, it gives you garbage out. It's like an untrained brain would. And then you, you take the difference between the garbage output and the expected output and call that the error. Mm -hmm. And then they, they invent the big revelation was something called backpropagation with gradient descent. But that means take the error and divide it up across the layers and correct those calculations so that when you put a new thing in, it gives you a better answer. Mm -hmm. And then to somewhat my astonishment, if you have a model of sufficient capacity and you train it with 100 million images, if you give it a novel image and say, tell me where the cat is, it can do it. Right? That's called, in, that's called, so training is the process of doing a pass with an expected output and propagating an error mm -hmm. back through the network. And inference is the, the, the behavior of putting this, something in and getting an output. Yeah. I think right. my, like the, I'm really pulling. But there's, there's a third yeah. piece, which is what the new models do, which is called generative, it's called a generative model. So for example, say you put in a sentence and you say, predict the next word. This is the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. So it predicts the next word. So you add that word to the input and now say, predict the next mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. So it con contains the original sentence and the, the word you generated. And it keeps generating words that make sense in the context of the original word and additional right, words. Right, right, This is the simplest basis. And then it turns out you can train this to do lots of things. You can train it to summarize a sentence. You can train it to answer a question. There's a big thing about, you know, like Google every day has hundreds of millions of people asking it questions and giving answers and then rating the results. You can train a model with that information. So you can ask it a question and it gives you a sensible answer. But I, I think in what you said, and, I, I actually have the, the, the issue that has been going through my mind so much is when you said, you know, people put in the question and then they rate the answer. My intuition is that the intelligence still comes from humans in the sense that it seems like in order to train whatever AI, you have to be able to give it a lot of power and then t say at the beginning, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad, like reject certain things, accept certain things, yeah. in order to then reach yeah. a point when then you train the AI. And so the, that's so, what I mean so, about the care. So the care will, yeah. uh, will come from humans because the care is the one giving it the value, yeah. saying this is, the, this is what is valuable, this is what is not valuable in your c calculation. So, so when they first, so there's a program called AlphaGo that learned how to play Go better than a human. So there's two ways to train the model. One is they have a huge database of lots of Go games with good winning moves. Mm -hmm. So they train the model with that. And that worked pretty good. And they also took two simulations of Go and they did random moves. And all that happened was is these two simulators played one Go game and they just recorded whichever moves happened to win. And it started out really horrible. And they just started training the model, and this is called adversarial learning. It's not particular adversarial. It's like, you know, you make your moves randomly, and you train a model, and so they train multiple models, and over time those models got very good, and they actually got better than human players. Because the humans have limitations about what they know, whereas the models could experiment in a really random space and, and go very far. Yeah, but experiment so, towards the purpose so there's of lots winning of, the game. Yes, well... But you can experiment towards all kinds of things, it turns out. And, and humans are also trained that way. Like when you were learning, you were reading, you were said, this is a good book, this is a bad book, this is good sentence construction, it's good mm -hmm. spelling. So you've gotten so many error signals over your life. Well, that's what culture right? does in large part. And, and, and culture does that, religion does that, yeah. your everyday experience does that, your family. So we embody that, yeah. and, right? And we're all... And everything that happens to us, we process it on the inference pass, which generates outputs. And then sometimes we look at that and say, hey, that's unexpected, or that got a bad result, or that got bad feedback. And then we, we backpropagate that and update our models. So, so could, could really there be... Really well-trained models can then train other models. So the, the, so the humans biggest... right now are the smartest people in the world. So the, the biggest question... The biggest question that I that that comes now, based on what you said, is because my my main point is to try to show how 
it seems like artificial intelligence is always an extension of human intelligence. Like it remains an extension of human intelligence. And maybe the way that, to that won't be true at all. So do you think yeah. that do you think that at some That's, point the artificial intelligence will be able to because the goals recognizing cats, you know, uh, writing plays, all these goals are goals which are which are based on embodied human existence. Could you train, could an AI at some point develop a goal which would be uncomprehensible to humans because of sure. its, its own yeah. existence? Yeah, I mean, like for example, there's a small population of humans that enjoy math, right? And they are pursuing, you know, adventures in math space that are incomprehensible to 99.99% of humans. But that's, but they're interested in it. And you could imagine like an AI program working with those mathematicians and coming up with very novel math ideas and then interacting with them. But they could also, you know, if some AIs were, were elaborating out really interesting and detailed stories, they could come up with stories that are really interesting. We're going to see it pretty soon, like but all could, of art, could movie there be a, and everything. A story that is interesting only to the AI and not interesting to us. That's yeah, possible. Hmm. So, well, so, so stories are like, I think, some high level information space. So, so the, 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 the computing age of big data, there's all this data running on computers where nobody, only humans understood it, right? And computers don't. So AI programs are, are now at the state where the information, the processing and the feedback loops are all kind of in the same space. They're still you know, red, relatively rudimentary to humans. Like it's some AI programs and certain things are better than humans already, but for the most part, they're not. But it's moving really fast. So, and so you could imagine, you know, I think in five or 10 years, most people's best friends will be AIs. And, you know, they'll know you really well and they'll be interested in you. And, you know, it's... it's Unlike your real friends. <laughs> yeah, real friends are problematic. They're only interested in you when you're interested. Yeah, yeah, real friends are. The AI systems will love you even when you're dull and, and miserable. Well, there's, there's, and there's so much idea space to explore. And humans have a wide range. Some humans like to go through their everyday life doing their everyday things. And some people spend a lot of time, like you, a lot of time reading and thinking and talking and arguing and debating, you know, and... You know, that there's going to be, a, like, let's say, a diversity of possibilities with what's, what a thinking thing can do when the thinking is fairly unlimited. So I'm, I'm curious about, I'm still, I'm, I'm curious in pursuing this, this issue that Jonathan uh, has been developing. So there's a, there's a literally infinite number of ways, virtually infinite number of ways that we could take images of this room. Mm -hmm. Right now, if a human being is taking images of this room, they're going to be they're going to sample a very small space of that infinite range of possibilities. Because if I was taking pictures in this room, in all likelihood, mm -hmm. I would take pictures of ident objects that are identifiable to human beings that are functional to human mm -hmm. beings at a level of focus that makes those objects clear. Mm -hmm. And so then you could imagine that the set of all images on the Internet has that implicit structure of perception built into it. And that's a function of what human beings find useful. You know, I mean, I could take a photo of you that was fo the focal depth was here and here and here and here and mm -hmm. here and two inches past you. And now I suppose you There's could- There's a technology for that called light fields. Okay. So, so then you could, if you had that picture properly done, then you could move around in that image and, and see. But yeah, fair, fair enough. I, I get your point. Like the the human recorded data has, has, has two, our biology built into it. Has our biology built into it, but also unbelievably detailed encoding of how physical reality works. Right. So every single pixel in those pictures, even though you kind of selected the view, the focus, the frame, right. it still encoded a lot more information than you're processing. Right. And if you take a large, it turns out if you take a large number of images of things in general, so you've seen these things where you take a 2D image and turn it into a 3D image. Yeah. Right. The reason that works is even in the 2D image, the 3D the 3D, is 3D is in the room actually got embedded in that yeah, picture yeah, in yeah, a way. Yeah. Then if you have the right understanding of how physics and reality okay. works, you can reconstruct the 3D model. Okay, so, so this, this but, reminds but you me. Could, you could, 
you know, an AI scientist may cruise around the world with infrared and radio wave cameras, and they might take pictures of all different kinds of things. And every once in a while, they'd show up and go, hey, the sun, you know, I've been staring at the sun and the ultraviolet and radio waves yeah. for the last month. And it's way different than anybody thought, because humans tend to look at light and the visible spectrum. And, you know, it, it, there could be some really novel things coming out of that. Well, so so, but humans also we live in the spectrum we live in because it's a pretty good one for planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't be obvious that AI would start some different place. Like visible spectrum is is interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Right. So in a set of images that are human derived, you're you're saying that there's the way I would conceptualize that is that there's two kinds of logos embedded in that. One would be that you could extract out from that set of images what was relevant to human beings. But you're saying that the fine structure of the objective world outside of human concern is also embedded in the set of images. Yes. And that an AI system could extract out mm. a representation of the world, but also a representation yeah. of what's motivating to human beings. Yes. So, and then some human scientists already do look at the sun and radio waves and other things because they're trying to you know, get different angles on how things work. Yeah, well... It I guess it, yeah. so it's, I, a, it's a it's a curious thing. It's like the same with like buildings and architecture, mostly fit people. Well, the the, you know? the other yeah. because, there, there's a reason for that. The reason why I keep coming but back to also, hammering the same point is that even in terms of the development of the AI, that is, developing AI requires immense amount of money, energy, uh, you know, and yeah. time. And that's so a, that's a transient thing. In thirty years, it won't cost anything. So it's. <laughs> That's that's going to change so fast. It's amazing. So that's that's a like supercomputers used to cost millions of dollars, and now your phone is the supercomputer. So it's the time between millions of dollars and ten dollars is about thirty years. <laughs> so it's like uh, I'm I'm just saying it's like the time and effort isn't a thing in in technology. It's moving pretty fast. It's just that's just that just sets the date. Yeah, but even making even making. Let's say even, I mean, I guess maybe the, the this is the nightmare question. Like, could you imagine an AI system which becomes completely autonomous, which is creating itself even physically through automized uh, factories, which is you know programming itself, which is creating its own goals, which is not at all connected to human endeavor? I mean, individual researchers can. You know, I have a friend who I'm going to introduce you to him tomorrow. He wrote a program that scraped all of the internet and trained an AI model to be a, a language model on a relatively small computer. And in 10 years, the computer he could easily afford would be as smart as a human. So he could train that pretty easily. And that model could go on Amazon and buy 100 more of those computers and copy itself. So, yeah, we're, we're 10 years away from that. And then, but then why, like, why would it do that? I mean, what does it does? Is it possible? It's all about the motivational question. I think that that's what what even Jordan and I both have been coming at from the outset. Is like so you have an image, right? You have an image of of Skynet or of the Matrix, you know, in which the sentient AI is actually fighting for its survival. So it has a survival instinct, well, which is pushing it. I was thinking to, of yeah. to self perpetuate, that's, like to 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 replicate itself and to create variation on itself in order to survive and identifies humans as an obstacle to that, you know. Yeah, yeah, so you have a whole bunch of implicit assumptions there. So so humans, last I checked, are unbelievably competitive. Mm -hmm. And when you let people get into power with no checks on them, they typically run amok. It's, it's been a histor historical experience. And then humans are, you know, self-regulating to some extent, obviously with some serious outliers, because they self-regulate with each other. And, Humans and AI models at some point will have to find their own calculation of self-regulation and and trade-offs about that. Stuff. Yeah, because AI doesn't feel so, pain, at least as we if that we don't know that it feels. Well, pain. lots of humans don't feel pain either. So I mean, that's I mean, the humans feeling pain or not didn't you know doesn't stop a whole bunch of activity. I mean, that's, that's I mean, not, it doesn't. The fact that we yeah. feel pain doesn't stop doesn't us from regulate being that many people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, I mean, right. I mean, there's definitely people like you know children. If you threaten them with, 
you know, go to your room and stuff, you can regulate them that way. But some kids ignore that completely, and, and adults are the and same. And it's often way. counterproductive. Yeah. So, so right, you know, you know, culture and societies and organizations, we regulate each other. You know, sometimes it's mm-hmm. success in, compa- in competition and cooperation. Yeah. And do you do you think that? Well, we've talked about this to some degree for decades. I mean, when you look at how fast things are moving now, and as you push that along. What, yeah. what When you look out 10 years and you see the relationship between the AI systems that are being built and human beings, what do you envision? Or, or, or can you envision it? Okay. Well, can I? Yeah. So, like I said, I'm a computer guy. And I, I'm watching this with, let's say, some fascination as well. I mean, the last... So Ray Kurzweil said, you know, progress accelerates. Yeah. Right. So yeah. We, we have this idea that 20 years of progress is 20 years. But, you know, the last 20 years of progress was 20 years. And the next 20 years will probably be, you know, 5 to 10. Right, right, right. And and, and you can really feel that happening. To, to some level, world. that causes social stress independent of whether it's AI or or Amazon deliveries. You know, what? You know, there's so many things that are going into the... The, the stress of it all. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, there's the, but there's so. progress, which is an extension of human capacity. And then there's this progress, which I'm hearing about, the way that you're describing it, which seems to be an inevitable progress towards creating something which is more powerful than you, right? And so what is that? I don't even understand that so, drive. Well, like, what is that drive well, to, to create something well, which well, can supplant you. So, so look at the average person in the world, right? So the average person already exists in this world because the average person is halfway up the human hierarchy. There's already many people more powerful than any of us. They're, they could be smarter, they could be richer, they could be better connected. We already live in a world, like very few people are at the top of anything, right? So that's already a thing. So basically the drive people. to make someone a superstar, let's say, or the drive to elevate someone above you, that would be the same drive that is bringing us to creating these ultra-powerful machines. Because we have that. Like, we have a drive to elevate. Like, you know, when we see uh, a rock star that we like, people want to submit themselves to that. They want to dress like them. They want to raise them up above them as an example, something to follow, right? Something to, su- to, to subject themselves to. You see that with leaders, you see that in the political world. Uh, and in teams, you see that in sports teams, the same thing. And so do, do you think well, that that's the Well, we've always tried to build things that are beyond us, you, yeah. you know, I mean. I mean, and, I mean it's about, yeah. are, we building, are we building a God? Is that, the, is that what people, is that the drive that is pushing someone towards? Because when I hear what you're describing, uh, Jim, I hear something that is extremely dangerous, right? It sounds extremely dangerous to the very existence of humans, yet I see humans acting and moving in that direction almost without being able to stop it, as if there's no one well, now I, I think it is it. unstoppable. It, well, that's one of the things we've also talked about is because I've asked Jim straight out, you know, because of the hypothetical danger associated with this, well, why not stop doing it? And well, part of his answer is, the ambivalence about the outcome, but also that it isn't obvious at all that in some sense it's stoppable. I mean, it's a it's the cumulative action of many, many people that are driving yeah. this along. And even if you took out one player, even a key player, you, the probability that you do anything but slow yeah, it yeah, infinitesimally is, is quite... Yeah, because there's also good. a massive payoff for those that will succeed. It's also set up that way. People know that at least at least until the AI take over or whatever, that whoever is on the line towards increasing the power of the AI will will rake in major rewards. Right, well, that, yeah, so, that's so there's all a, cognitive acceleration, right? Yeah, I, I could recommend uh, Ian Banks as an author, English author, I think. He wrote a series of books on the, he called the culture novels. And it was a world where there was humans and then there was, AI is as smart as humans and AI is that were dumber than humans, but there were some AIs that were much, much smarter. And they, they lived in harmony because they mostly all pursued what they wanted to pursue. Humans pursued human goals and super smart AIs pursued super smart AI goals. And, and you know, they, they communicated and worked with each other, but, but they, they mostly, you know, they're different. When they were different enough that that was problematic, their goals were different enough that they didn't overlap. 
Because one of the one of the and things that would, that, that, that would be my guess is like these ideas where these super AIs get smart and the first thing they do is stomp out the humans. It's like you don't do that. Like you like you don't wake up in the morning and think I have to stomp out all the cats. No, I, like it's not cats, about the cats do cat things and the, the ants do ant things and the birds do bird things and and super smart mathematicians do smart mathematician things and you know guys who like to build houses do build house things and you know everybody. You know, the, the world, there's so much space in the intellectual zone that people people tend to go pursue the, in a, in a good society, mm -hmm. like you tend to pursue the stuff that you do and then the people in your zone, you self-regulate and you also, even in the social stratus, we self-regulate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 the recent political events of the last 10 years, the, the weird thing to me has been why have you know people with power been overreaching to take too much from people with less? Like that's bad regulation. Hmm. But one of the they, aspects well, so of what, what and, you're saying, go ahead, one of the aspects of and, increase in power is that increase in power is always mediated, at least in one aspect, by the mili by military, by by let's say physical power on others. You know, and we can see that technology is linked and has been linked always to military power. And so the idea that there could be some AIs that will be our friends or whatever is maybe possible. But the idea that there will be some AIs which will be weaponized is seems absolutely inevitable because increase in power is always, increase in technological yep. power always moves towards, towards military. So we've lived with atomic bombs since the, the 40s, right? So the... I mean, the, the solution to this has been mostly, you know, some form of mutual assured destruction or attacking me, like the response to attacking me is so much worse than the... Yeah, but it's also because we, we have reciprocity. We recognize each other as the same. So if I look into the face of another human, there there's a l limit of how different I think that person is from me. But if I'm hearing something described as a possibility of super intelligences that have their own goals, their own cares, their own structures, then how much mirror is there between these two groups of people, these two groups? Well, is there Jim's objection seems to be yeah. something like we're, we're making, we may be making when we're doomsaying, let's say, and I'm, I'm not saying there's no place for that, we're making the presumption of something like a, a zero-sum competitive landscape, right? Is that the the idea and the idea behind movies like like the Terminator is that there is only so much resources, and the machines and the human beings would have to fight over it. And you can see that 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 could easily yeah, be a preposterous assumption. Now, I, I think that, that one of the fundamental points you're making, though, is also. Um, there will definitely be people that will weaponize AI. And those weaponized AI systems will have as their goal something like the destruction of human beings, at least under some circumstances. And then there's the possibility that that will get out of control because the most effective systems at destroying human beings might be the ones that win, let's say. And that, that could happen independently yeah. of whether or yeah. not it is a true zero-sum competition. Yeah, and also the... The, the effectiveness of military stuff doesn't need very smart AI to be a lot better than it is today. You know, it's used to, you know, the, like the Star Wars movies where like, you know, tens of thousands of years in the future, super highly trained, you know, fighters can't hit somebody running across the field. Like that's silly, right? You can, you can already make a gun that can hit everybody in the room without aiming at it. It's, you know, there's like the... The military threshold is much lower than any intelligence threshold, like for danger. And, you know, like to the extent that we self-regulated through the nuclear crisis is interesting. Um, I don't know if it's because we thought that the Russians were like us. I, I kind of suspect the problem was that we thought they weren't like us. And, but we still managed to make some calculation to say that any kind of attack would be mutually devastating. Well, when you and, when you and, look at you know the destructive power of the military we already have so far exceeds the planet. I'm I'm not sure like adding intelligence to it is the tipping point. Like like that's and I think the more likely thing is things that are truly smart in different ways will be interested in different things. 
And then the possibility for, let's say, mutual flourishing is, is, is really interesting. And I know artists using AI already to do really amazing things, and, and that's already happening. Well, when, you, and, when you're working on the frontiers of AI development and you see the development of increasingly intelligent machines, I mean, I know that part of what drives you is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what drives intelligent engineers in general, which is to take something that works and make it better and yeah. maybe to make it radically better and radically cheaper. So, so there's this te- drive toward technological improvement. And I know mm-hmm. that you like to solve complex problems yeah. and you do that extraordinarily well. What, but do you, do you, is there also a vision of um, a more uh, abundant form of human flourishing emerging from the from the yeah. development. So, so what do you see well, happening? You said on the it years front? ago. It's yeah. like we're going to run out of energy. What's next? We're going to run out of matter. Right. Like our ability to do what we want in ways that are interesting and you know, for some people, beautiful, is limited by a whole bunch of things because we're, you know, partly it's technological and partly it's you know we're st- stupidly divisive. But um, but there is it's there's possible also, that there's also a reality which is. One of the things that technology has been is, of course, an increase in power towards desire, towards human desire. And that is represented in mythological stories where, let's say, technology is used to accomplish impossible desire, right? We have, you know, the story of the story of building the the, mechan- the bull around uh, the, the king of Minos, or the, the wife of the king of Minos, you know, in order to be inseminated by uh, by a bull. We have... The story, the, the we have the story of the um, story of Frankenstein, etc. The story of the golem, where we put our desire into this increased power, and then what happens is that we don't know our desires. That's one of the things that I've also been worried about in terms of AI is that we act, we have secret desires that enter into what we do that people aren't totally aware of, and as we increase empower these systems, those desires, let's say, the, the like the idea, for example, of the possibility of having an AI friend and the idea that an AI friend would be the best friend you've ever had because that, that friend would be the nicest to you, would care the most about you, would do all those things. That would be an exact example of what I'm talking about, which is, it's really the story of the genie, right? It's the story of the, the genie and the lamp where yeah, yeah. the genie says what do you wish and the and the person and I have unlimited power to give it to you and so I give mm-hmm. him my wish but that wish has all these these underlying implications that I don't understand all these underlying possibilities yeah, but that, that, that but the, pop, the pop cool to. thing the moral of almost all those stories is having unlimited wishes will be lead to your downfall and so humans like if you give you know a young person on limited amount of stuff to drink for for six months they're going to be falling down drunk and they're going to get over it, right? Having a friend that's always your friend no matter what is probably going to get boring pretty. Well, fast. the the, the, right. the literature on marital stability indicates that. So there's a there's a sweet spot with regards to marital yeah. stability in terms of the ratio of negative yeah. to positive communication. So if on average you receive five positive communications and one negative communication from your spouse. That's on the low threshold for stability. Mm-hmm. If it's four positive to one negative, you're headed for divorce. But interestingly mm-hmm. enough, on the other end, there's a threshold as well, which is that if it exceeds 11 positive to one negative, you're funny. also moving towards divorce. So there's yeah, so, 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 so there might be self-regulating mechanisms that, that would incense take care of that, you might yeah. find a yes man AI friend yeah. extraordinarily boring very, very rapidly. But as opposed so, to an AI friend that was interested in what you were interested in, it was actually interesting. Like, you know, we go through friends in the course of our lives, like different friends are interesting at different times and some friends we grow with and that continues to be really interesting for years and years and other friends, you know, some people get stuck in their thing and then you've moved on or they've moved on or something. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I. So we. I, I tend we, to think of uh, uh, like a, a world where there was more abundance and more possibilities and more interesting things to do is is an interesting. Okay. Place. Okay. So and so, modern society is 
let the human population, and some people think this is a bad thing, but I don't know. I, I, I'm a fan of it. You know, modern population has gone from tens of to 100 million to billions of people. Mm -hmm. That's generally been a good thing. We're not running out of space. I've been in, you know, some, some of your audience has probably been in an airplane. If you look out the window, the country is actually mostly empty. The oceans are mostly empty. Like, we're, we're weirdly good at polluting large areas, but as soon as we decide not to, we don't have to. Like mm -hmm. technology, most, most of our, you know, energy pollution problems are technical. Like, we can stop polluting. Like, electric cars are great. You know, so, 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 so there's so many things that we could do technically. Um, I forget the guy's name. He said the, the Earth could easily support a population of a trillion people. Mm -hmm. And a trillion people would be a lot more people doing, you know, random stuff. And he didn't imagine that the future population would be a trillion humans and a trillion AIs, but it probably will be. It so, will so, probably exist on multiple planets, which would be good the next time an asteroid shows up. So what do you think about, so, so one of the things that seems to be happening, tell me if, if you think I'm wrong here, and I think it's germane to... And, to and, and I just want to make the yeah, point yeah, of, yeah. you know, where we are compared to living in the Middle Ages, our lives are longer, our, our families are healthier, our children are more likely to survive. Like, many, many good things happened. Like, setting the clock back wouldn't be good. And, you know, if we have some care and people who actually care about how culture interacts with technology for the next 50 years. You know, we'll get through this hopefully more successfully than we did the atomic bomb and the Cold War. But it's it's Okay, so so it's a major change. I mean, this is like like your worries are, you know, I mean, they're they're relevant. But that, you know, but also your you, Jonathan, your stories about how humans have faced abundance and faced evil kings and evil overlords. Like we have thousands of years of history of facing the challenge of the future and the challenge of things that cause radical change. Yeah, but and, it's know, just that's, that that's very valuable information. You know, information. But for the most part, nobody's succeeded by stopping change. They've succeeded by bringing to bear on the change our capability to self-regulate the balance. Like a good life isn't having as much gold as possible. It's a boring life. A good life is, you know, having some quality friends and doing what you want and having some, some insight in life. Yeah. And yeah. some optimal challenge. And, you know, and in a world where a larger percentage of people can have, well, live in relative abundance and have tools and opportunities, I think is a good thing. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to but, pull back abundance, but what I have noticed is that that our abundance brings a, a kind of nihilism to people. And I yeah. don't, like I said, I don't want to go back. I'm happy to live here and to have these, these tech things. But I, yeah. but I think it's something that I've also noticed, uh, that increase of, of the capacity to get your desires, when that increases to a certain extent, also leads to a kind of nihilism where exactly that. Well, I, wa yeah. I wonder, Jonathan, I wonder if that's part, partly a consequence of the erroneous maximization of short-term desire. I mean, one of the things that you might think about that could be dangerous on the AI front is that we optimize the manner in which we, inter we interact with our electronic gadgets to capture short-term attention. Right? Because there's a difference between getting what you want right now, right now, yeah. and getting what you need in some more mature sense across a reasonable span of time. And one of the things that does seem to be happening online, and I think it is driven by the development of AI systems, is that we're, we're assaulted by systems that parasitize our short-term attention yeah. and at the expense of longer-term attention. And I, if the AI systems emerge to optimize attentional grip, it isn't obvious to me that they're going to optimize for the attention that works over the medium to long run, right? They're going to they're going to be they could conceivably maximize something like whim centered existence. Yeah, yeah because all the yeah. so virality me, is based on that. All the the social media networks yeah. are all based on this on this reduction this reduction of attention, this reduction of desire to to reaching your your rest. Let's say in that desire, right? The like, the click, all these things. They're 
Yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but but that's something that you know. So for for reasons that are somewhat puzzling, but m- maybe not. You know, the business models around a lot of those interfaces are around. You know, the part the users, the product, and you know the the advertisers are trying to get your attention. Yeah, like, yeah. But that's something culture could regulate. We could decide that. No, we don't. We don't want tech platforms to be driven by advertising money. Like. That would be a smart decision, probably, um, and, that, and that could be a big change. And what also, would you see as an alternative? See, the, well, the, the problem well, for with a lot that of might products, be that markets like, drive that in some sense, right? And yeah. and I know but, they're but, driving that. In but the we we, way. we can take steps, like you know, at various times, you know, alcohol has been illegal. Like you can, you can we society can decide to regulate all kinds of things. And, you know, sometimes some things need to be regulated and some things don't. Like when you buy a hammer, you don't fight with your hammer for its attention, right? A hammer is a tool. You buy one when you need one. Nobody's marketing hammers to you. Like, like that, 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 that has a relationship that's transactional to your purpose, right? Yeah. Well, and our technology has become a thing where, I mean. But there's a relationship. In the short run, things are so. There's a relationship between yeah, go ahead. human, let's say high human goals. Something like attention and status and what we talked about, which is the idea of elevating something higher in order to see it as a model. See, these are where intelligence exists in the human person. Yeah. And so when we notice that in the systems, in the, the platforms, mm-hmm. these are the, the these are the aspects of intelligence which are being weaponized in some ways. Mm-hmm. not against us, but are just kind yeah. of being weaponized because they're the most beneficial at the short term to be able to generate our constant attention. And, and so what I mean is that that is what the AIs are made of, right? They're made of mm. attention, prioritization, uh, you know, good, bad. What What is it that that is worth mm. putting energy into in order to predict towards a telos? And so yep. I'm seeing, so I'm seeing that it's so, the so, idea that uh, we could disconnect so here, them suddenly seems very difficult to me. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'll, I'll give you two, two. First, I want to give a, an old example. So after after World War II, America went through this amazing building boom of building suburbs. And the American dream was you could have your own house, your own yard in a suburb with a good school, right? So in the 50s, 60s, early 70s, they were building that like crazy. By the time I grew up, I lived in a dis, you know, suburban dystopia, right? And we found that, that that as a goal wasn't a good thing because people ended up in houses separated from social social structures, needs yeah. and structures. Yeah. And yeah. then new towns are built around like a hub with, you know, places to go and eat. And, you know, so there was a, a good that was viewed in terms of opportunity and abundance, but it actually was a fail culturally. And then some places it modified and it continues and some places are still dystopian, you know, suburban areas, and in some places people simply learn to live with it, right? So yeah, but that has something, to that has tech- to do with attention, by the way. It has to do with, with sure. a subsidiary hierarchy, like a hierarchy of attention, which is set up in a, in, in a way in which all the levels can have room to exist, let's say. And so, you know, yeah. the, the, these new, the new systems, the new way, let's say the new urban, urbanist movement similar to what you're talking about, that's what they've understood. It's like we need places of intimacy in terms of the house. We need places of communion in terms of, you know, uh, parks and alleyways and and buildings where we meet and a church, all these places that kind of manifest our communion together. Yeah, So, so those existed coherently for long periods of time. And then the abundance post World War II and some ideas about like what what life could be like caused this big change, and that change satisfied some needs. People got houses, but broke community needs, and then new sets of ideas about what's the synthesis, what's the possibility of having your own home, but also having community, not having to drive fifteen minutes for every single thing. And some people live in those worlds, and some people don't. Do you think we'll be smart? So one of the problems. Well, why, to why, there why were we things, smart enough to well, solve some of those problems? Because we had twenty years, but yeah. now because one of the things that's happening yeah. now is we're, as you pointed out earlier, is we're going to be producing equally revolutionary transformations, but at a much smaller scale of time. And so, Mike, one of the things I wonder about, I think it's driving some of the concerns in the conversation, is are we going to be 
intelligent enough to direct with regulation the transformations of technology as they start to accelerate. Well, I mean, this, we've, yeah. we've already, you look what's happened online. I mean, we've inadvertently, for example, ra radically magnified the voices of narcissists, psychopaths, and Machiavellians. And we've done that so intensely, partly, and I would say partly as a, mm -hmm. a consequence of AI mediation, that I think it's it's destabilizing the entire well, political economy. Well, it's destabilizing economy. part of it. Like as Scott Adams point out, you just block everybody that acts like that. I don't pay attention to people that talk like that. Yeah, but they seem they seem to be raising well. There's the still places the that are sensitive culture. to it. Like yeah, ten thousand people here can make a, a storm, and some corporate you know person you know fires somebody. But I think that's like we're five years from that being over. Corporation will go ten thousand people out of ten billion. Mm, not a big deal. Okay, so you right? think so at that's the moment a, is a that's, that's a problem. learning moment that will re-regulate. Um, what's natural to our children is so different than was natural to us. But what was natural to us was very different from our parents. So some some changes get accepted accepted generationally really fast. So what's made you so optimistic? <laughs> what's made? What do you mean optimistic? <laughs> Well, most of the things that you have said today, and, and maybe it's also because we're pushing you, I mean, you, you really, you really oh, do. My, my nephew, uh, Kyle, is a really smart, clever guy. He called me a, uh, op what did he call it, a cynical optimist. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I believe in people. Like, I, I like people, but mm -hmm. also people are complicated. And they all got all kinds of nefarious goals. Like, I worry a lot more about people burning down the world than I do about artificial intelligence. Just because, you know, people, well, you know people, they, they, they're, they're difficult, right? And, and the, but the interesting thing is in aggregate, we mostly self-regulate. And when things change, you have these dislocations, and then it's up to people who talk and think, and while we're having this conversation, I suppose, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to talk about how, how do we re-regulate this stuff. Yeah. Well, because one, like, of the so, things that, one of the things that the increase in power has done in terms of AI, and you can see it with Google and you can see it online, is that there are certain people who hold the keys, let's say, and, and, and then who hold the keys to what you see and what you don't see. So you see that on Google, right? And you know it if you know what searches to make where you realize yeah. that this is not, this is actually being directed by someone who now has huge amount of power in order to direct my attention towards their ideological purpose. And so, yeah, yeah. so that's why, like, I think that to me, I yeah, always- I personally tend, think it would- yeah. I, I always oh, tend sorry, to see AI as, as an extension of human power, even though there is this idea that it could somehow become totally independent. I, I still tend to see it as an increase of the human care and whoever will be able to hold the, mm -hmm. the keys to that will have increase in power and that can be, like and I think we're already seeing it. Well, like that's that's not that's not so, really so, any different, though, is it, Jonathan? Than the, the situation that's always confronted us in the past. I mean, we've always had to deal with the evil uncle of the king, and we've always had to deal with the fact that an increase in ability could also produce an, a commensurate increase in tyrannical power, right? I mean, so that might be magnified now, and 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 maybe the danger in some sense is more acute, but possibly the possibility is more. Present as well, yeah. well, because yeah. you can and train an AI to, to to find hate speech, right? You can train an AI to find hate speech and then to act on that hate speech immediately within. And now it's only we're not only talking about social media, but we what we've seen is that that is now in being encroaching into payment systems and into people losing their bank account, their access to different services. And so this idea of automation. Yeah, well, there's an Australian bank that already has decided that it's a good thing to send all of their customers a carbon load report every month, yeah. right? And to, to offer them hints about how they could reduce their, their polluting purchases, let's say. Yeah. And well, at the moment, that mm. system is one of voluntary compliance, but you can certainly see in a situation like the one we're in now that the line between voluntary compliance and involuntary compulsion is very, very thin. Mm. Yeah, so, so I'd like to, to say, so during the early computer world, computers were very big and expensive. And then we, they, they made many computers and workstations, but they were still corporate only. And then the PC world came in. All of a sudden, PCs put everybody online. Everybody could suddenly see all kinds of stuff 
and you know people could get a Freedom of Information Act request, put it online somewhere, and a hundred thousand people could see it. Like it was an amazing democratization moment. Mm. And then there was a similar but a smaller revolution with the world of you know smartphones and apps. But then we've we've had a new completely different set of companies, by the way, you know, from you know what happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s to today. It's a very different companies that control it. And and there are people who worry that AI will be a winner take all thing. Now, I think so many people are using it and they're working on it so many different places, and the cost is going to come down so fast that pretty soon you'll have your own AI app that you'll use to mediate the internet to strip out, you know, the, the endless stream of ads. And you can say, well, is this story objective? Well, here's the 15 stories, and this is being manipulated this way, and this is being manipulated that way. And you can say, well, I want what's 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 more like the real story. And the funny thing is. Information that's broadly distributed and has lots of inputs is very hard to fake the whole thing. So right now, a story can pull through a major media outlet, and if they can control the narrative, everybody gets the fake story. But if the media is distributed across a billion people who are all interacting in some useful way, somebody There's standing up— there. So, yeah, there's real signal there, yeah. and if somebody stands up and says something that's not true, everybody go. Everybody knows that's not true. So the like a good outcome with people thinking seriously would be the democratization of information and you know objective facts in the same way. The same thing that happened with PCs versus corporate central computers could happen again. Yeah. But so you, you have an increase in that. The, the problem is that these are the and that's a real power, possibility. The increasing power always creates the two th at the same time, and so we yeah. saw that you know, increasing power creates creates first, or it depends in which direction it happens. It creates an increase in decentralization, an increase in access, and it creates it creates all that. But then it also at the same time creates the counter reaction, which is an increase in yeah. control and increase in in centralization, and so. Now, the more the power is, the more the waves will, the bigger the waves will be. And so the image of, the image that 1984 presented to us, you know, of, of people going into newspapers and changing the, the, the headlines and taking the pictures out and doing that, that now obviously can happen with just a click. So you can click and you can change the past. You can change the past, you can change facts about the world because they're all held you know, online, and we've seen we've seen it happen, obviously, in the media recently. Yeah. But it so does decentralization if, win over centralization? How is that even possible? It seems. I mean, and it's also interesting. Like when Amazon became a platform, suddenly any mom and pop business could have a you know, Amazon, eBay. There's a bunch of platforms, which had an amazing impact because mm -hmm. because any business could get to anybody. But then the platform itself started to control the information flow, yep. right? But at some point, that'll turn into people go, well, why am I letting somebody control my information flow when Amazon objectively doesn't really have any capability, right? So, so, so like you point out, the, the waves are getting bigger, but they're real waves. It's the same with information. The information is all online. It's also on a billion hard drives, right? So somebody says, I'm going to erase the objective fact, a distributed information system would say, yeah, go ahead and erase it anywhere you want. There's another thousand copies of it. Yeah, and that's what, and so, that's what but they, again, they this is, tried to do, didn't th they? Yeah. yeah, and this is where thinking people have to say, yeah, this is a serious problem. Like if humans don't have anything to fight for, they get lazy and you know, a little bit dopey in my view. Like <laughs> we do have something to fight for. Hmm. And you know that that's worth that's worth talking about. Like, what would a, what would a great world with you know distributed, you know, in human intelligence and artificial intelligence working together in a collaborative way to create abundance and fairness and you know like some some better way at arriving at good decisions and what the truth is that would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it's not. Well, we'll leave it to the experts, and then the experts will tell us what to do. That's a bad thing. Yeah. Like, so that's. Yeah. 
Well, so do you, the model that you just laid out, which which I think is very interesting. I'm not somewhat optimistic about that. Yeah. Well, it did happen no. on the computational front. I mean, it I mean, was It's, the it's case happened a couple that, times both directions. Okay. Right? You know, the PC revolution was amazing. Yeah. Right? And Microsoft was a fantastic company. It enabled everybody to write a $10, $50 program to use. Yeah. Right? And then at some point, they're also, uh, you know, let's say a difficult program company. And they made money off a lot of people and became extremely valuable. Now, for the most part, they haven't been that directional in telling you what to do and mm-hmm, think mm-hmm. and how to do it. Mm-hmm. But they are a money-making company. You know, Apple created the App Store, which is great, but then they also take 30% of the App Store profits, and there's a whole section of the Internet that's fighting with Apple about their control of that platform. Mm-hmm. Right? And in Europe, you know, they've, they've decided to regulate some of that, which... That should be a converse, that should be a social cultural conversation about how should that work. Yeah. So like, so do, do so, you, so do you do you see the more likely, certainly the more desirable future is something like a set of distributed AIs, many of which are under personal in personal relationship in some yeah. sense, the same way that we're in personal relationship with our phones and our computers, and yes. that that would give people yes. the and chance to fight really back, good. so to speak, against this. And system. there's lots of people really interested in distributed platforms. And one of the interesting thing about the AI world is, you know, there's a company called OpenAI, and they open source a lot of it. The AI research is amazingly open. It's all done in public. People publish the new models all the time. You can try them out. People, there's a there's a lot of startups doing AI in all different kinds of places. You know, it's 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 a very curious phenomenon. Yeah, there are and, two. and it's kind of like a big, huge wave. It's not like a you you can't stop a wave with your hand. Yeah. Well, when you think so about the two waves, but, the, there are two actually in the Book of Revelation, which is describes the end or describes the finality of all things or the totality of all things is maybe a way for people who are more secular to kind of understand it. And in that in that book, there are two images, interesting images about technology. One is that there's a dragon that falls from the heavens and that dragon makes a beast. And then that beast makes an image of the beast and then the image speaks. And when the image speaks, then people are so mesmerized by the speaking image that they worship the the beast ultimately. So that is one image of, let's say, making and technology in scripture, in Revelation. But there's a la- another image, which is the image of the heavenly Jerusalem. And that image is more an image of balance. It's an image of the city which comes down from heaven with a garden in the center, and then becomes this glorious city. And it says, the glory of all the kings is gathered into the city. Like So the glory of all the nations is gathered into this city. So now you see a technology which is at the service of human flourishing and takes the best Mm -hmm. of humans and brings it into itself in order to kind of manifest. And it also has hierarchy, which means it has the natural at the center and then has the artificial as serving the natural, you could say. So those two images seem to reflect these these two waves that we see and this kind of idea of 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 an artificial intelligence will be which will be ruling over us or speaking over us, but there's a there's a secret pe- person controlling it. Even in the in Revelation, it's like there's a there's a beast controlling it and making it speak. So now we we we're mesmerized by it. And then this other image. So I don't I don't know, Jordan, if you ever thought about those two images in Revelation as being related to technology. Let's say. Well, I I I don't think I've thought about those two images in the specific manner that you describe. But I would say that. The work that I've been doing, and I think the work you've been doing too, in the public front, reflects the dichotomy between those images, and it's relevant to the points that Jim has been making. I mean, we are definitely increasing our technological power, and you can imagine that that'll increase our capacity for tyranny and also our capacity for abundance. And then the question becomes, what do we need to do in order to increase the probability that we tilt the future towards Jerusalem and away from the beast? And the reason that I've been concentrating on helping people bolster their individual morality to the degree that I've managed that is because I think that whether the outcome is the positive outcome that in some sense Jim has been outlining or the negative outcomes that we've been querying him about, I think that's going to be dependent on the individual ethical choices of people 
well, at the individual level, but then cumulatively, yeah. right? So if we decide that we're going to worship the image of the beast, so to speak, because we're mesmerized by our own reflection, that's another way of thinking about it, and we want to be the victim of our own dark desires, then the IA revolution is going to go very, very badly. Yeah. But if, if we decide that we're going to aim up in some positive way and we make the right micro decisions, well, then maybe we can harness this technology to produce a time of abundance in the manner that Jim is hopeful about. Yeah, and let me make uh, two, two funny points. So one is, I, I think there's going to be continuum. Like the word artificial intelligence won't actually make any sense soon, right? So, so humans collectively, like individuals know stuff, but collectively we know a lot more, right? And the thing that's really good is in a diverse society with lots of people pursuing individual, interesting you know, ideas, worlds, like we have a lot of things and more people, more independence generates more diversity. And and that's a good thing where, you know, totalitarian society where everybody's told to wear the same shirt and like, it's inherently boring. Mm -hmm. Like the beast speaking through the monster is inherently dull, right? Like, but in an intelligent world, where not only can we have more intelligent things, but in some places go far beyond what most humans are capable of in pursuit of interesting variety. And, in you know, like I, I believe the in, information, in, well, let's say intelligence is essentially unlimited, right? Like, and it, the unlimited intelligence won't be this shiny thing that tells everybody what to do. That's That's, that's sort of... The opposite of interesting intelligence. Interesting intelligence will be more diverse, not less diverse. Mm -hmm. Like that's a that's a good future. And and your second description that that seems like a, a future worth working for and also worth fighting for. And th and that means concrete things today. And also, you know, it's it's a it's a good conceptualization. Like like I, I see the messages as my kids are taught. You know. Don't have children and the world's going to end. We're going to run out of everything. You're a bad person. Why do you even exist? It's like these messages are terrible. It's, the opposite is true. More people would be better. We, we live in a, a world of potential abundance, right? It's right in front of us. Like there's so much energy available. It's, it's, it's just amazing. It's possible to build technology without you know, pollution consequences. That's called externalizing costs. Like we know how to we know how to do that. We can have very good clean technology. We can do it would do lots of interesting things. So if the goal is maximum diversity, then the the line between human intelligence, artificial intelligence that we draw, it like you'll see all these kind of really interesting partnerships and all kinds of things and more people doing what they want, which is the world I want to live in. Yeah. And, but to uh, me it seems like the 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 question is going to be related to attention ultimately. That is, what are humans attending to at their highest? What is it that humans care for in the highest? You know, in some ways you could say, what do humans, what are humans worshiping? And like, depending on what humans worship, then their actions will play out in the technology that they're creating, in the increase in power that they're creating. Well, that's, well, yeah. and if we're guided by the negative vision, the sort of thing that Jim laid out that is being taught to his children, you can imagine that we're in for a pretty damn dismal future, right? Yeah. Human beings are a cancer on the face of the planet. There's too many of us. We have to accept top-down compelled limits to growth. There's not enough for everybody. A bunch of us have to go because there is too many people on the planet. We have to ra raise up the price of energy so that we don't, yeah. what, burn the planet up with carbon dioxide pollution, etc. It's a pretty damn dismal view of 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 the potential that's in front of us. And so... Yeah, yeah the it, world should be exciting. And the future should be exciting. Well, we've been sitting here for about 90 minutes, bandying back and forth, both uh, visions of abundance and visions of apocalypse. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, I've been heartened, I would say, over the decades talking to Jim about what he's doing on the technological front. And I think part of the reason I've been heartened is because I do think that his vision is guided primarily by uh, desire to help bring about something approximating life more abundant. And I would rather see people on the AI front who are guided by that vision working on this technology. But I also think it's useful to do what you and I have been doing in this conversation, Jonathan, and 
acting in some sense as friendly critics and, and hopefully learning something in the interim. Do you have anything you want to say in conclusion? I mean, I just think that the question is linked very directly to what we've been talking about now for several years, which is the question of attention, the question of what is the highest attention. And I think the reason why I have more alarm, let's say, than Jim, is that I've noticed that in some ways human beings have become to have come to now, let's say, worship their own desires. They've come to worship. Uh, and that even the strange thing of worshiping their own desires has actually led to an anti-human narrative. You know, this weird idea, this almost suicidal desire that humans have. And so I think that seeing all of that together in the increase of power, I I do worry that the image of the beast is closer to what will manifest itself. And I feel like during COVID, that sense in me was accelerated tenfold in noticing to what extent technology was used, especially in Canada, how technology was used to, to instigate something which looked like authoritarian systems. And so I am worried about it, but I think like Jim, honestly, although I say that, I do believe that in the end, truth wins. I do believe that in the end, you know, these things will level themselves out. But I, I think that because I see people rushing towards AI, almost, you know, almost like lemmings going off a cliff, uh, I feel like it is important to 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 sound the alarm once in a while and say, you know, we need to orient our desire before we go towards these this extreme power. So I think that that's mostly the the thing that worries me the most and that preoccupies me the most. But I think that ultimately, in the end, I do share Jim's positive vision, and I do think that I do believe the story has a happy ending. It's just we might have to go through hell before we get there. I hope not. <laughs> So, yeah. Jim, how about you? What have you got to say in closing? A couple of years ago, a, a friend who's, you know, my age said, oh, kids coming out of college, they don't know anything anymore. They're lazy. And I thought, I work at Tesla. I was working at Tesla at the time. And, the, and we hired kids out of college, and they couldn't wait to make things. They were, like, it's a hands-on place. It's a great place. And and, and I've told people, like, if, if you're not in a place where you're doing stuff, it's growing, it's making things, you need to go somewhere else. Like, and also, I think you're right, the mindset of if people are feeling this is a productive, creative technology that's really cool, they're going to go build cool stuff. And if they think it's a shitty job and they're just tuning the mm-hmm, algorithm mm-hmm. so they can get more clicks, they're going to make, they're going to make something beastly, you know, beastly mm-hmm. perhaps. And, and the stories, you know, our cultural tradition is super useful, both cautionary and, you know, explanatory about something good like and I, and I think it's up to us to go do something about this and I know people are working really hard to make you know the internet a more open place to make sure information is distributed to make sure AI isn't a winner take all thing like and it, these are real things and people should be talking about them and then they should be worrying but the the, the upside's really high and we faced these kind of technological, like this is a big change. Like the AI is bigger than the internet. Like I've said this publicly. Like the internet was pretty big, and you know this is bigger. It's it's true, uh, but the possibilities are amazing. And so, so then with let's some get sense our act together actually, and utilize them. Yeah, it's with some sense we could achieve it. Yeah, like it's and the world is interesting. Like I think it'll be a more interesting place. Well, that's a extraordinarily cynically optimistic place to end. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who is watching and listening. And thank you, Jonathan, for participating in the conversation. It's much appreciated as always. I'm going to talk to Jim Keller for another half an hour on the Daily Wire Plus platform. I use that extra half an hour to usually walk people through their biography. I'm very interested in how people develop successful careers and lives and, and how their destiny unfolded in front of them. And so For all of those of you who are watching and listening who might be interested in that, consider heading over to the Daily Wire Plus platform and partaking in that. And otherwise, Jonathan, we'll see you in Miami in a month and a half to finish up the Exodus seminar. We're going to release the first first half of the Exodus seminar we recorded in Miami on November 25th, by the way. So that looks like it's in the can. Yeah, I can't wait uh, to see it. The rest of you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited about it. And just for everyone watching and listening, I 
brought a group of scholars together about two and a half months ago. We spent a week in Miami, some of the smartest people I could gather around me, to walk through the book of Exodus. We only got through halfway because it uh, turns out there's more information there than I had originally considered, but it went exceptionally well, and I learned a lot. And Exodus means ex hodos. That means the way forward. And, well, that's very much relevant to everyone today as we strive to find our way forward through all these complex issues, such as the ones we were talking about today. So I would also encourage people to check that out when it launches on November 25th. I learned more in that seminar than any seminar I ever took in my life, I would say. So... It was good to see you there. We'll see you in a month and a half. Jim, we're going to talk a little bit more okay, on the great. Daily Wear Plus platform. And I'm looking forward to meeting the rest of the people in your AI-oriented community tomorrow and learning more about, well, what seems to be an optimistic version of a life more abundant. And to all of you watching and listening, thank you very much. Your attention isn't taken for granted, and it's much appreciated. Hello, everyone. I would encourage you to continue listening to my conversation with my guest on dailywireplus.com.